and um, we'll go live. Good afternoon, everyone. Can I just confirm, Luke, that you can hear me OK? Yeah, loud and clear. Thank you. Um, welcome to the Short Straits technical webinar. This is a, an event about moving freight from EU to GB from the 1st of January 2022. I'd like to hand the microphone to Stephen Webb, the director for Border Readiness in the Border and Protocol Delivery Group. Stephen, can you hear me? Not sure we have Stephen on the line. Heather, is it OK if you um, kick us off instead? Yes, that's no problem. Um, Stephen, if you do join, uh, please feel free to interrupt. So as I've already said, uh, today's event is a short straight technical webinar for freight moving from the EU to GB from the 1st of January 2022. We're going to cover the practical detail of what you as a haulage or logistics company, a broker or an intermediary, and also what the driver will need to do to prepare and move goods from EU to GB after the 1st of January 2022 via the short straits. I'd like to thank you all for taking time to dial in today. I know we've got many representatives from the UK and France because this is also about the short straits, but there are also economic operators and representatives from many other countries because they are also users of the short straits. There are some 20 plus countries, including some beyond the EU. We hope that the information presented today will be useful and informative for all of you, wherever you're joining us from today. One of the UK's prior government's priorities since the end of the transition period is to maintain fluidity at our borders. And the object of this webinar is to support the transport, logistics and intermediary sectors and the drivers themselves, all of whom have a role to keep our trade with the EU and beyond moving across the short straits. The webinar is designed deliberately to provide all actors in the supply chains with the tools and knowledge of systems and processes in order to move those goods and operate efficiently from the 1st of January 2022 when GB import controls for customs are implemented at the border. Thank you for your time today. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague David Smith, who's the director for Border Force Southeast, for his opening remarks. David. Uh, yes, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Heather said, my name is David Smith. I'm the uh, director for UK Border Force um, with responsibility for operations in the southeast of England. Um, and that includes uh, on the short straits routes, um, but also the inland border facilities uh, in Kent. <clears throat> I'm really pleased to be able to speak to such a wide range of companies and representatives this afternoon from across Europe who trade across the short straits. We all know <clears throat> what a key route this is to both UK and European trade, um, and it's critical that um, we ensure that we're be best placed to be able to keep that route running uh, in an optim optimum way. Uh, Border Force is responsible for the control of goods and people entering and leaving the UK at its borders. In addition to our border security role, Border Force completes customs procedures and compliance checks on goods imported to and exported from the UK. <clears throat> the southeast region of Border Force covers the ports of Dover and <coughs> Eurotunnel, um, as well as uh, the partner ports in Calais, Dunkirk and at Cockell, um, and also runs the inland border facilities at Sevington, Ebbsfleet, Stock 24 and Dover Western Docks. <clears throat> um, 
We operate 24 seven across the, both the ports and the inland border facilities and our operating model allows us to flex flexibly deploy resource according to demand in any one of those areas to ensure that we meet service standards. So as he Heather has said, really important event this afternoon um, where we can um, make sure that you are border ready to um, transport your goods both through the short straits ports um, but also to facilitate your journey through the inland border facilities as well. OK, that's uh, enough of an introduction for me. I will now hand back to Heather. Thank you, David. Uh, my name is Heather Jones. I'm uh, one of the deputy directors in the Border Readiness Directorate of Border and Protocol Delivery Group in the Cabinet Office. Uh, I've already said my welcome, so I think we can just move on to the first slide, please, Gillian. Thank you. This is our agenda for today. We've got a, a customer journey to go through, after which we will stop for a question and answer session. And then following that, there are some additional presentations. David's already explained, we'll talk you through what happens at the inland border facilities in the UK and the compliance regimes and the release mechanisms for getting the goods, the trucks and the drivers on their way to deliver their goods in the, into GB. We're going to cover something from the Department of Transport around the information and advice sites that they have in place where you will get help and support. And also finally, a look ahead to July 2022 from a customs perspective, where we'll cover something on the on the implementation of entry summary declarations and then a final wrap up session at the end. Thank you, Jill. Can we just have a quick usual trot through the ground rules? This is a Teams live event. So you won't be able to access the microphone or turn on your video unless you've been given presenter rights. Uh, we welcome your questions throughout the webinar. We've got um, many UK officials present to help you, but please ask in the uh, chat function within the question and answer bar on the screen. We'd like you to keep your questions and comments constructive and focused and someone will answer you today. And if they can't answer you today, we'll come back to you as soon as possible after this event. We would like, like to say, could you ask your questions in English because we can't commit to answering questions in any other languages. And obviously following the presentation, we will publish a recording of this webinar and we'll be sharing the slide pack with all attendees afterwards. So we'll make a start on the walkthrough of the customer journey. And this session is about two sets of processes to move goods from the EU to GB from the 1st of January 2022 to be able to successfully export goods from the EU and import goods to GB and the systems and procedures that you would need to know about. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a very useful summary uh, of the French and GB processes, which has been provided to us by the French Customs Administration. I don't intend to cover it now, but it is included here for you to look at during and after the webinar. Thank you. So we want to make a start on the customer journey. So we'll start with uh, an introduction to the short straits for goods moving from EU to GB from the 1st of January. And these are the elements of the processes that we're going to talk about today. There are obviously some prerequisites, including when the contract starts. We're going to cover the EU export and GB import preparation processes. We'll cover the processes for when you check in at the EU border. We'll cover exiting the EU and what happens during the crossing, what you need to do to check if you're selected for a customs inspection. We then move on to arrival of the truck and the, or trailer and goods into GB and what you need to do and where you need to go if you've been selected for a customs inspection. And then we'll cover the post inspection process, delivery of the goods and the contract ending. So HMRC, I think you can uh, come in and cover the basic requirements for the haulage company, please. Thank Paul. you very much. Thanks, Heather. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Earnshaw. I work for HMRC in the UK on haulage readiness for the ending of stage customs controls. And for this slide, I'm going to cover the basic requirements for a haulage company for EU to GB movements from a UK perspective. So these requirements are as follows and as demonstrated on the screen here. You must firstly have a valid GB ERE number. 
you must also have a registration for GVMS, the Goods Vehicle Movement Service. You must have access to GVMS, the Goods Vehicle Movement Service, so you're able to generate goods movement references, which we refer to as GMRs. You also need to be able to print documents or alternatively have the means to supply your driver with an electronic copy of the documents via a smartphone. One key point around registration and the GBRE is that you will need to sign up to a government gateway account in the UK through gov.uk. Something else to note as well that you can apply for a GBRE even if you don't have one as part of that registration for GVMS. Also, you don't need to be established in GB to obtain a GB or, a, or indeed sign up to GVMS. So I'm now going to hand back over to Heather briefly, who's going to pre jointly present the next slide with me on the driver basic requirements. Heather, I think you're on mute. My apologies. To prepare for the export from the EU, the driver must have all of their export accompanying documents, their EADs printed off, as well as the export MRN or MRNs, either from each EAD or from each transit document, or they can be combined together into the French logistics envelope. An important point, you do not need to register to access the logistics envelope service. However, it's important to ensure that the haulage company or the intermediary knows how to use it. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Heather. So from the UK perspective, you're also going to need the following. And the first is the ability to be able to check the status of a goods movement reference during a crossing. Fire a smartphone, for example. You'll also need a valid passport for the journey. You will also need haulage company contact details for the back office or HQ in case of any difficulties. And you will need a valid goods movement reference, which we also know as a GMR. So moving on to the next slide, Heather and I are going to look at the two systems, GVMS and SI Brexit in France, and how these are different. So firstly, with regards to GVMS, key thing is that for GVMS, it requires registration by the haulier. Now the haulier may be defined as the following. They may be defined as an independent driver transporting goods and doing their own customs paperwork. They could be a company that subcontracts to pick up goods on behalf of another business. They may be a logistics business hired to transport goods and complete customs processes on behalf of another business, or they could be a large retail business that transports and declares their own goods. Now a haulier may delegate responsibility for this to an agent, intermediary or other third party, such as a broker. But in all cases, we strongly recommend that you register for GVMS as soon as possible if you're going to be moving goods into GB ports. And we advise you don't wait until the last minute, even if you don't need to use it until January 2022. Now that covers the registration part. Second key aspect of GVMS is the haulier must actively enter the various customs references into that GMR that they've obtained from a declarant or trader. Now, this could be an entry reference number from the UK import system, which we call Chief, known as Customs Handling of Import and Export Freight as its full name. Or it could be some other reference number, for example, a Common Transit Convention, TAD MRN. Next key point is the GMR must be validated on the EU side at check in with the carrier. And a key point is that whilst uh, GVMS has been active for common transit convention movements from the 1st of January 21. It will become applicable for all other movement types, for example, those imports declared into chief we mentioned, or CDS, or ATA or TIR carnet movements from January 2022. Last but not least, the vehicle ID must be known as well for GVMS. We'll just hand back to Heather now to cover the SI 
Brexit side? Thank you, Paul. It's a very short one. Uh, the French SI Brexit system is effectively a back office, a transparent system that's transparent to the haulier as well as it is to all the other economic operators, which means that they do not need to directly interact with it. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk you through now the, the scenario. So this, this journey is, is based on an export of standard goods from the EU and the corresponding import to GB using the short straits again, 1st of January 2022. We are not using transit in this exercise, but transit processes will be displayed on the screens in brackets and transit colleagues from the UK are available to answer any questions. The customer journey starts from when the contract is received up to the successful movement into GB when the contract is completed. And the journey is now going to be broken down into these separate steps. And I'll cover the processes for the export from the EU. And then my colleagues in HMRC will cover the steps that you need to take to import to GB. So to, to be precise, in, real, in reality, you may do some of these preparation steps for the export from the EU before, after or at the same time as some of the UK import steps, which we, we, which we will show next. So the first stage, the whole year will receive the contract. The declarant will have sent all the export accompanying documents, the EADs associated with the movement. If this is a transit movement, there would be either a TAD, a transit accompanying document, which you will need to produce a paper version of. And you should also print off all the EADs for the movement. There could be more than one for the contract. You can also group the EADs together using the French logistics envelope service. It's important to stress that this is all of the preparation needed for the export documents process. And that important point is to make sure that you have all of the EADs either separately or in the logistics envelope. You also need to prepare for the import to GB and I'll hand back over to Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. So this is the equivalent pre-arrival process for imports from a GB perspective focused on GVMS. So we start on the left hand side of this slide here. It's step 1A. And that always starts with the haulier or intermediary logging into GVMS using that government gateway account. Moving on to step 1B, the GMR is created by populating those pre lodged reference numbers, for example, an entry reference number, and also the intended vehicle and crossing details are added at this stage. Important point, if you are moving common tra transit convention movements, you would, all, you would add the TAD movement reference number at this stage. And similarly, if you were adding ATA or TAR carnet reference, the same would apply. Now, moving on to the next steps, step one and uh, step one C and one D, these really happen around the same time. I mean, firstly, the driver needs to be provided with the GMR. Now that can be printed, or it could be an electronic version in the form of, say, a PDF or a screenshot. They would also need a contact number to report to if any issues are encountered. So that would be with, say, the haulier or broker's back office or intermediary's back office. Also, at the same time, the GMR should have been by that checked by that haulier office or intermediary to ensure that there are no errors there and it is correct and ready to be checked in with carrier. Last step in this is really ensuring all the previous steps are in place and then you can actually start to leave for the EU border. If I could move on to the next slide, please. OK, so just to summarise, these are the steps to take and the main points to note for a haulier before riding, arriving at the EU place of exit from a GVMS perspective. So first and foremost, register for GVMS. Uh, this can be done now and you will need that GBORI and you don't need to be UK established to get either of these. Just to reiterate, we advise that you do this now as soon as possible and don't leave that until late in December. Also, next step, you need to create a goods movement reference or GMR from GVMS for all movement types. Now, this can be done up to 28 days in advance of the journey. 
and validation of the movement reference numbers entered into the GMR takes place when that GMR is populated. So you can check then whether these are correct or not. The goods should be loaded to the vehicle and trailer and all those relevant customs references added to the GMR. Point being, you will need to get these customs references from your declarant or trader you are interacting with. The driver should be provided with the GMR. And when that GMR is taken to the border, it is scanned at the EU border by the carrier. If the GMR is not valid at the border. It will be rejected and return an error to whoever created the GMR. Important point to note is that a movement reference number or entry reference number cannot be linked to multiple GMRs, so you cannot make that mistake of entering one MRN across many GMRs. Last but not least, the vehicle registration number of VRN or trailer registration number or container reference num number for unaccompanied trailers or containers needs to be put input into the GMR along with that indicative departure and destination port and terminal. I'm just going to hand over to Heather to introduce the next slide that we will both present on. Thank you, Paul. So again, I think I'm repeating what I've said in previous slides, but it's important to emphasize that point that for the export process uh, at the ferry check-in or pit stop at Eurotunnel, so at the EU border, that the relevant EADs should be presented for scanning. So if there's more than one, make sure that they are all presented or indeed it's lo the logistics envelope that is uh, handed in. Uh, the driver must present all the EADs and if the vehicle reports um, for a French customs inspection if requested to or orange routed. Paul, can you take the uh, part from the top of the slide, please? I will indeed. Thank you, Heather. So in terms of the UK part of the process and that's step 2.1 on here, uh, the GMR is presented by the driver to the carrier, which is in turn validated by that carrier as per step 2.2a using their link into GVMS. So this is provided usually in a barcode form and scanned by the carrier, uh, although it can be uh, it can simply be the GMR ID from the GMR that can be entered uh, by the carrier. Either way, they will carry out that validation at this stage. Now, if the GMR details are invalid as per step point 2.2b, then the vehicle is not successfully checked in and will be turned around. In these instances, it will be necessary to move away from the port to take steps to ensure that the issue is corrected. And that's for example, by the driver contacting the haulage office to rectify the GMR. But once the GMR is corrected, you will be able to report to the carrier to check in again. Now, when that GMR is checked in successfully, the driver can continue and will be directed towards border force at the juxtaposed control points for any official checks required as highlighted in 2.2c. And assuming all those checks are in order, the driver can then board the vessel. If I could have the next slide, please. OK, so in terms of how you can have a successful crossing. OK. On the left hand side there, uh, from the French perspective, you'll need to ensure the driver presents all the relevant export MRNs, EADs. The envelope service can help you group them so the driver only has one document to scan. Secondly, in moving along, you should make sure your GMR is correct before crossing. This is usually done in the office of the haulier or agent or third party appointed by the haulier. However, the driver may do this if they have GVM access and are the owner operator. However you do this, though, you should ensure the GMR is valid and isn't a duplicate or has the wrong vehicle registration number. Moving along again to the right, a contact number for the head office or back office of the um, haulier or agent or appointed third party is essential so the driver knows who to call to help them resolve any issues. And finally, a valid passport is needed for the driver now. 
I'm now just going to pass across to my transit colleague, uh, James Dip, who's going to give some more information about errors with uh, common transit convention movements. Uh, over to you, James. I think we just are still on the previous slide. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Dib, uh, as Paul says, and I'm part of the UK HMRC team working on transit and transit policy. Uh, I just wanted to set this brief opportunity to highlight a few common errors uh, we're seeing from the perspective of goods arriving into the UK under transit. Uh, number one is hauliers not ending movements at the Office of Destination slash authorised consignee locations. So within this, some hauliers are not, are not delivering the goods and the TAD to the Office of Destination slash authorised consignee location to close the transit movement. Um, instead, they are delivering the goods directly to the final customer without closing the movement. If the movement is not ended correctly at an Office of Destination slash authorised consignee location, uh, then the guarantee is not released and the movement will then enter the, the inquiry process. So Holliers should be reporting to Office of Destination upon arrival, and this ensures that the guarantee is properly released. Number two, um, declaring the wrong Office of Transit for entry into the EU or other CTC territory. Here we are seeing some traders are not entering the correct Office of Transit on their transit declarations for entry into the EU or for subsequent entry into other CTC territories such as Norway, Switzerland or Turkey. To clarify, the Office of Transit is the port of entry into the next customs area, not the port of exit from the one being left. If the wrong Office of Transit is entered on the de declaration, then this can cause significant delays at the border for the driver. Uh, and finally, number three, Holly is not completing an Office of Transit upon entry into GB. Uh, within this, we are seeing a large number of hauliers who are not completing their Office of Transit on GVMS when entering into the UK and instead are presenting a GB EORI. This is not a legally compliant option for moving goods under transit. So to re-emphasise with this one, an Office of Transit is required to be completed on GVMS upon entry into the UK or any other UCTC country. Thank you very much for your time. I'll now hand you back over to Paul. Thanks very much, James. And if we could move on to the next slide, please. OK, so what could go wrong? So this slide is a summary of what could go wrong if you have an invalid GMR at check in in the EU. In all cases, the way to avoid this is to ensure your GMR is valid in advance, as we've discussed previously. If, you, if your GMR is not valid in advance, you simply won't be able to board and you will need to go away and correct that. So some of the possible reasons for an invalid GMR, you could have a timed out GMR when you try to create it. Potential solution is that you do actually have the flexibility to create GMRs up to 28 days in advance of travel but also to just keep trying if you are having any difficulties completing that GMR and check the service availability pages for on gov.uk under goods vehicle movement service to see if there are any existing system problems. Another issue you may have is a failed pairing of the ANPR and data. And the way to ensure this doesn't happen is to ensure that the GMR is updated with the correct vehicle registration number Really important and significant if you are swapping vehicles at the last moment, which can happen. Uh, let's face it, it can happen quite often. So ensure that the GMR is actually updated with that correct vehicle registration number. The GMR can be completed and can be amended right up until the point of check in. So it's important that you actually do that to avoid that issue. Another issue may be a duplicate GMR. And the, the simple way to avoid that is to ensure that you're presenting the unique GMR for each movement and just be clear on what you are presenting. If you have an invalid GMR, the consequences are that you would be turned away from checking and you would need to move away from the port or too long stay parking to get that GMR corrected. So moving on to the next slide and what actually happens during a crossing, I'm just going to hand over to Heather again briefly it was going to present this next slide with me
Uh, thank you, Paul. Sorry, um, I'm muting and unmuting. So for the export process from the EU, um, the, we don't need to sort of labour this, but the, because we said already that SI Brexit is a transparent system, it's a back office system, but that system releases the EAD. So it moves on from there back into your world, Paul, please. OK, thank you. We did say it was really brief, didn't we, Heather? So, yeah, we, we're into step four. B now and uh, we're looking at the crossing from a GV perspective. So um, this is the uh, risk rating aspect of the of the process. So during the crossing, GVMS will send a separate electronic message to UK customs for the import and the GVMS process can continue by sending the data set within the GMR to GVMS. Now, during that time, all the movement reference numbers, entry reference numbers, etc., are disaggregated in GVMS and sent off to the relevant systems for risking. And this allows, as we say, for risking of the declarations and will send a tentative routing to the haulier and driver. Now, moving on to step 4C for common transit convention movements only, the Office of Transit function is completed as part of this remotely. And notice that you may need to go to an office of destination if you didn't actually use an in lab border facility for that, or you may need to go to the premises of your authorised consignee to end the transit movement. Step 4D on here. The haulier or the back office of the haulier will receive a notification from GVMS detailing if an inspection is required or if you are cleared to go. The driver can also check this status themselves via the GVMS web page called check if you need to report for an inspection using the GMR ID. Now a link to this service is included actually within the GMR itself when it is generated. So there is a UR in the L in there that can be checked from the, by the driver via a smartphone, for example. If the driver receives a hold notification from GVMS and consignments have been selected for a customs inspection, this will actually show the message inspection is required and the driver will need to attend an inland border facility on the GB side. The carrier will also receive a notification from GVS and may also pass that information on to, which I will uh, go into uh, in just a little while. However, regardless of your inspection outcome and regardless of whether you're using transit or not, you're not going to stop at the port or terminal on the GP side. Could have the next slide, please. OK, so reflecting on the action a driver should take, a driver will need to know if they're required to attend an inland border facility or for a customs inspection on arrival. Whoever actually created that GMR, whether it's the haulier in the back office or a broker or third party intermediary, they will be able to see the control status of the GMR on the GM VMS dashboard. Sorry. I did mention that drivers can also check the control status of the GMR themselves using the check if you need to report for an inspection service. Key points of the check you need to report for an inspection service is that you don't need access to GVMS itself. You don't need access to a government gateway account. You can simply access that via the URL contained within the GMR or via a direct link to the gov.uk side. All you need to be able to do is enter that GMR ID into the check if you need to report for an inspection service. Finally, some carriers will offer a, offer a service similar to this one at Eurotunnel, you can see. And as you can see there, drivers can see a list of vehicle registration numbers and their status on the TV screen and will help providing that message to drivers. So next slide, please. So the final slide for me is what could potentially go wrong during a crossing or on arrival into GB. And the slide is self is self explanatory to a point. If there is an issue with the smartphone device, for example, you lose the Wi-Fi or cellular connection, then you need to find another way to obtain a connection or contact the person or head office who is actually controlling the GMR to check that status. I also just want to draw your attention to system failure while we're here. If the system fails before checking, 
you should keep trying to submit the GMR and also check the service availability page on gov.uk for further advice. If there is a prolonged outage, full details will be supplied on there. The whole yeah, the really important thing to know is that we have robust fallbacks in place with carriers to, main fluid, to maintain fluidity and to keep goods moving. If there are failures for a sustained period, the business continuity process will be followed and carrier staff will direct the driver in terms of what to do next. Also, that system availability gov.uk pages will be updated as I mentioned earlier. I'm now going to hand over to my HMRC colleague, Phil, who I understand is going to cover the next slide, uh, freight selected for a custom control. So thank you and over to Phil. Many thanks, Paul. Good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Phil Moxon. I work, as Paul has said, for HMRC. Uh, I'm responsible for our inland border facilities, um, and I'm going to talk through a little bit about what will happen when a driver arrives, uh, the journey from the port to an IBF, and some background information that will be useful regarding what actually happens when the driver attends the inland border facility. So as you can see on the screen, there are eight steps that we've covered on this slide. The step one is the haulier drives from port to IBF. So this will the, probably be the driver rather than the haulier who will do that. Uh, they will be directed by signs, road signs, uh, to an IBF and via the IBF app. So that depends upon which actual IBF facility that the driver will look to attend. So that may well be going up the M22 Sevington or beyond up towards uh, Ebb's fleet being the two main key IBFs that are in that are in Kent. OK, step three. So the actual arrival for the driver at the IBF, the automatic number plate recognition camera will pick up the vehicle registration and they, the driver will be met by a security marshal who will direct them to the front office of the IBF. Uh, where they will be asked to provide the relevant paperwork relating to the goods that are being moved. Those goods, depending upon the type of movement, um, th th those the paperwork relevant to that type of movement, sorry, um, will be discussed with the front office and to make sure that the driver can provide everything that they need. Um, the, the actual process for being on site where they're directed to a parking area. Some IBF sites do have designated parking area depending upon the type of movement that is undertaken. Um, there are actually two types of separate um, checks really that I want to cover off on this slide. And that is that as we've seen from Paul, uh, drivers may be directed to an IBF for a customs check, a physical or a documentary check by our Border Force colleagues. And this would have been notified via GVMS. They, you may also, the driver may also be undertaking a movement for CTC, Common Transit Convention, at an IBF. So if arriving from the EU, that will be an Office of Destination check and the documents relevant to that will be required. If it's, a, as I say, a physical or a documentary check, the goods may be expected and uh, depending upon the requirement of border force when we're there. Um, and then if all paperwork is in place and the checks can be finished and completed, the taller the driver will be able to leave the IBF and go on their onward journey. So that that summarizes the key points per the slide on the screen. There's just a couple of other points that I would like to make. Not all drivers need to attend an IBF. For example, if you are starting or ending a CTC movement at the premises of an authorised consignor or consignee, and you have already validated the transit accompanying document or the TAD, you do not need to attend an IBF. You would only attend an IBF if you were moving goods through the ports of Dover, Eurotunnel or Holyhead. The predominant points of contact at the IBF will be HMRC and Border Force colleagues. And as I say, there will be other colleagues on site, traffic marshals, um, to actually assist the driver with their movement and make sure that they have the relevant paperwork. And as Paul's alluded to on one of the previous slides, I believe it was slide 19, the driver having uh, an up-to-date contact number for the haulier 
or the agent or any third party who is responsible for moving those goods is essential because if we cannot cl clear if the goods have not been arrived as an office of destination movement and if we cannot clear those movements we will ask the driver in the first instance if they can contact the relevant person and see if we can get those goods arrived uh, just a little bit about the ibf in terms of demand we do see the highest volumes of traffic at the IBF between Tuesday and Friday, uh, particularly in the afternoon between one and five. So if drivers can undertake their movements in the evenings or throughout the night when the sites are quicker, potentially they will be quieter and it may mean that they are processed more quickly. Uh, thank you for listening to that IBF overview and I'll pass you back to, is it? Heather? <laughs> Hi, thanks, Phil. Yes, um, this is a summary slide of, of everything that we've covered in the uh, very fast walkthrough of the process, so I don't intend to read it all out to you again, but we're offering this slide to you as exactly that a summary of the step one, step A, step one, part A, step one, part B, step two, step three, step four. Um, so you can look at this after the event and then come back to us if you have any follow up questions to our contact details. But thank you to Phil and thank you to Paul for that uh, excellent presentation of the process. Could we, uh, Luke, are you ready? almost to become prepared for facilitating our question and answer because I, I notice from the chat, which obviously I've not been looking at as closely as you have during the presentations, but we have a lot of questions. I think some very useful ones that the audience would uh, welcome uh, feedback from UK government, please. If there's any uh, for Border Force or for, for me on the elements that I presented, please give them to us as well. Luke, can I hand to you? Thank you, Heather. Yes, uh, thank you for your questions. I can see a few we've already got some early answers to, so thank you to colleagues for doing that. Lots uh, still outstanding. Um, if we could just start with a kind of, I guess, a, a, an intro question to HMRC. Will there be any sort of further training for GVMS, either for the freight forwarder, the intermediary, the haulier or the driver at all? And where can people access that training? So in terms, Luke, in terms of further sessions that, uh, that 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 we will be providing, we will be running a, a number of webinars in late November, early de December on uh, GVMS, what we're calling GVMS release 2.2, which of course brings um, brings those import movements into scope from the first of first of January. So we will we will run through all of those processes and we will also demonstrate how you can actually use the web user interface, the front end system, how you would enter those various movement types. We'll also cover the S exports aspects. I know it isn't something that we've covered particularly here today, but we the exports comes in from GB to, to EU from the from the first of January as well. So we will be covering that aspect in those webinars. Invites will be coming out and issued shortly through the uh, through the trade associations. Uh, I think some of my colleagues can probably add some more to that. That's what I can add from a GVMS readiness perspective. I don't know if Lorna or George or anybody else wants to add any anything further. Yes, I'll come in here, Paul. Just to add to that, um, we are scoping out at the moment, holding some additional industry days that we'll walk through very specifically how you register for GVMS, how to create a GMR. Um, so those invitations hopefully will be coming out very shortly and those events again will happen in the next few weeks um, to really try and provide that lower level detail. Great, thank you everybody for those answers. Um, we've got quite a few on groupage and GVMS uh, from sort of freight forward as, as well. I'll give one as an example, although thank you, there's been a, quite a few questions. The example is, how does GVMS reconcile the number of pre-lodged import decks slash MRNs for transits against what is actually loaded on the vehicle? So for example, if 20 shipments are loaded, um, so it would expect to see 20 import, 
uh, declarations or MRNs, depending on what's going on in the truck. Um, but only 15 are entered. How would GVMS know this? And, and also, could you just talk a bit more broadly? I think there's quite a lot on groupage about how GVMS works with groupage loads more generally. George, are you able to assist with that uh, with that particular question? Or is it one we need to take? I think we may need to take that that specific one uh, away. I'm afraid. Uh, I know that so so GVMS ha has been sort of designed in in such a way that it should uh, facilitate and accommodate groupage loads, and has has sort of particularly been uh, developed in in a way that as as Paul has sort of run through uh, should allow um, multiple uh, declaration references to be entered into. Uh, into the GMR, uh, we might have to come back on the sort of specifics of uh, how that sort of reconciled um, at the uh, at the point of departure. But I think uh, sort of important to flag that uh, it is a uh, a responsibility and a legal responsibility to ensure that um, there is proof of uh, of all of the uh, declarations having been pre lodged. Um, before the uh, before the goods arrive uh, or before the, the goods board uh, on the EU side. Uh, so there is a, a responsibility uh, to ensure that all of those uh, declaration references are included within uh, within a GMR. Thank you. And I know the focus today is obviously on imports into the UK uh, exports from the EU, but can you just confirm, George, if that will be the same for UK exports using GVMS as well? Yes, yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Um, the, a question from an agent here. So they say, as an agent working on behalf of other European haulage companies that wouldn't have access to the GVMS system, are there any liability issues for the company that is issuing the GVMS GMRs on behalf of these entities? Um, is it possible to talk a little bit about liability there and who should be um, owning the GMRs and what role intermediaries and forwarders will need to play? OK. I can come in on 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 this one, Luke, and uh, you know, and I'll I'll allow George to to interject as he as, as he sees fit. Um, in terms of responsibility for creating that GMR, it does actually lie with the haulier. That's where the onus is. Um, I went through some of the haulier def definitions earlier, and I, you know, I'm happy to run through them again. So you, you're looking at that could be an independent driver transporting goods and doing their own customs paperwork, or it could be a company that subcontracts to pick up goods on behalf of another business. It could be a logistics business hired to transport goods and complete customs processes on behalf of another one, or it could be a large retail business that transports or declares their own goods, or it could be something similar to those definitions. I, I. Um, I, I relayed there. Um, what GVMS does though, it does actually have the flexibility for a haulier to actually delegate that to a, a third party. So that could be a broker, it could be a agent or it could be some other third party, but ultimately that 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 responsibility does lie with the haulier for that registration. George, I don't know if you have any further to add on that at all or any of my other colleagues do. No, I, th I think that's I think that's spot on, Paul. So, um, so while the uh, sort of responsibility for uh, customs border formalities uh, and uh, and complete completing declarations rests with trainers, uh, it is for the the haulier to ensure that uh, that the driver is given all of the necessary uh, customs documentation and sort of ensure that they've been uh, informed of of their responsibilities. Uh, regarding presenting the the GMR to uh, to the carrier and uh, following instructions uh, that, are that are provided through GVMS. So not much more to add, Paul. I think that's spot on. Thank you. Um, there's just 
a few questions as well on accompanied versus unaccompanied. Obviously, this is the short straight, so predominantly accompanied, though not exclusively. Um, but for unaccompanied trailers that will be using GVMS, um, they won't have a vehicle or tractor ID. Could you talk a little bit about how they will be identified and what needs to be input? So it is possible to enter the um, either the container reference number or the trailer reference number into the GMR like you would for a, for a vehicle registration number. So that's how you would that's how you would enter it for unaccompanied freight, and you would actually state that your that your goods are unaccompanied. You do actually have that option within the within the GMR to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, Another question for non inventory ports using GVMS. Will a pre lodgement IMD route H declaration still be required or will everything have to be submitted as IMA goods arrived? So we, we may want to come back, I think, on uh, on the, the technical detail of that, but um, but my understanding is that uh, GVMS facilitates the uh, arrival uh, of those pre-lodged declarations and I think there may have been a, another question uh, in here around uh, in the in the Q&A uh, around completing manual arrivals which is the the process that's uh, that is uh, currently uh, followed under the stage customs controls. Um, GVMS will facilitate the uh, arrival of, uh, of, de of pre-lodged declarations that are put through GVMS um, so hopefully that provides a bit of clarity, but we may also want to, to come back on the uh, the technical detail. Thank you very much. Um, we're sticking with GVMS. Um, I think that seems to be from the audience questions the, the kind of hot topic here. Um, what if the carrier forgets to register one of the customs references in GVMS? Can we add this to the GVMS portal after it has crossed the border? in order to get the release message from Chief. I don't know if anyone's able to come in on that. I think all I would say on, on this is that it is very important uh, that all declaration references are included uh, within the GMR for all of the goods uh, that are moving before the goods uh, board on the on the EU side. Um, so my, my understanding would be that uh, that uh, retrospective adding of declaration references to a GMR would, would not be allowed um, and that it is a, a responsibility to ensure that declaration references uh, are held for all goods uh, that are uh, that are moving before they uh, board on the EU side. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question about the GVMS login process and the actual user experience. Why is the two factor authentication necessary for GVMS login? Um, the question says it costs a lot of time for big transportation companies. Hi Luke, it's Alex yeah. Sharp. I'm happy to take that away, um, but all that I would say is that all our government services do cover the two-factor authorisation, so I would assume that that blueprint will have been covered for GVMS, but I can um, go back and see if there's any way that we can um, disaggregate that. Great, thank you. Um, Somebody's asked what you only need. Sorry, <clears throat> if you only need one Ducker, so that's a unique consignment number to get a GMR, how is it known what is actually on the vehicle after the GMR is scanned? Is anyone able to take that from HMRC? So I think we might need to take that one away, Luke. I think, yeah, I think it's, do, it's a yeah. compliance um, kind of question, I think. So we need to take that away and check that we can get the correct answer. OK, thank you. 
Um, so sort of going back to training, I guess, which we talked about a little bit earlier, somebody has asked if there's a dress rehearsal system to enable traders to become familiar with the information needed beforehand. Is there sort of a test area where actors in the supply chain can try GVMS out? Hi Luke, it's Paul. Um, no, I'm afraid there isn't a test environment for uh, for GVMS. However, um, HMRC are running currently running some testing of the system, testing of the live system, known as live proving. So, if any hauliers would would like to wish to volunteer to participate in that, if you could pass the details on to us, we'll be more than happy to pass them on to the live proving team. Um, but but short of a of a, a test environment which we don't have that's that's the next best thing i'm afraid thank you is there a sign up link or an email hauliers can contact we could paste as an announcement in the q a for for people in the audience today good shout luke i will go away and uh, and get that great thank you very much um a more general question now, I think it re relates to GVMS, but is, is a bit bigger than that. So the question it says, is anyone in considering the volumes of loads entering GB and the issue that most EU suppliers cannot produce documents until the time of loading, thereby the short period of time we get to produce GB entries and then GVMS details while the goods are in transit? Are you prepared for queues and issues? What are the solutions to keep things moving? Um, so I suppose to just editorialise a bit, the question is GVMS assumes that we can get the sort of UK import decks and so on in advance to add to the GMR. What happens when you can't do this? Is this one we may need to take away? Colleagues on the HMRC side concur. The same one can. I comment. think that would be a good idea, Paul. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm just. There was one other I wanted to ask, and I've just lost it now. Apologies. Um, there's a question about support. So, what will the support hours be for GVMS? Sorry, Luke, can I just um, come in briefly, please? Yeah, please do. Just to say on some of the questions that we've seen in the chat, um, the, Stephen can't unfortunately access his microphone at the moment. My director who is responsible for infrastructure and border readiness. And there is an operational testing team within BPDG that's looking to do a lot of testing, which includes obviously GVMS elements. So um, we can come back on further detail about that, but any interested parties should get in touch with us, Luke, through our normal email address, which hopefully you'll, you'll show at the end. And then a second strand, just to um, save HMRC's um, voices for a, a few seconds at least. There's a lot of questions about inventory link ports in the chat, and obviously this event is about the short straights. So just to also uh, let you know that my team are also developing a similar webinar to this one, a technical webinar on those arrangements for the inventory link ports too. So we don't need to cover those questions today because they'll be covered in that subsequent event. Thanks, Luke. Thank you. And I know we've had, yeah, as Heather said, there's questions about inventory link ports and other routes as well, which will be covered there. Um, just one on the driver um, routing before we move on to session three. Finally, uh, we showed the the driver routing screen. We've had a couple of questions on what that how that links in with SPS goods and also how it links in with other, uh, for example, your, your route one, two or six at Dover. So is it possible to give a little bit more detail about how that routing is calculated and how that links with an, any DEFRA systems that may be coming in from July? Hi, it's Phil. Um, I think what I can see on that one, Luke, is that um, as you say, for, from July 2022, um, for SPS checks um, undertaken by our colleagues in DEFRA, they will go to Sevington IBF. So when those goods are identified, the, the driver will be directed directly to Sevington. And as it stands at the moment, that is the only prompt that a driver will get to go to a specific IBF. As we've said, for an office of destination movement coming into the UK from the EU, 
the the choice is really the driver and the hauliers and you can of course pre-notify to go to an IBF so they can go to an IBF of choice what it will do as well of course is as we've already covered there will be a, a, a prompt for uh, a border force check either a physical or a documentary check that will be undertaken and again that will most likely for um, a driver point them to Sevington but again that may be possible to go to say Ebsfleet in Kent as well so I think for for a DEFRA check SPS that is the one that we know that we were directed to Sevington um, sorry look was, was there another was there another aspect of that question in the second part no thank you Phil I think that covers it off I think there were just uh, questions about how the driver will will need to know um, where they need to go um, it's now three o'clock UK time so is it possible if we could move on to the next slide please um, so we've got some additional presentations I will now hand over um, to my colleague Fiona Gaffney um, for our first presentation on inland border facilities thank you that's great thanks very much Luke uh, good afternoon everybody um, you already heard a, a little bit earlier on from uh, my colleague Phil from HMRC um, about some of the IBFs and some of the processes <clears throat> and indeed the question that was just raised about Sevington too and um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit more of an overview of uh, what the IBFs are where they are what they do and um, just to give you a bit more insight this afternoon um, so the inland border facilities are the UK government sites where customs and documentary checks take place away from the port locations. Um, they act as the officer departure for the outbound journeys and officers for destination for the inbound journeys. Um, checks for the following movements are carried out there. So the CTC, uh, Common Transit Convention, ATA Carne, uh, TIR Carne, CITES as well. And as Phil mentioned earlier on, you only need to go, it's not for everybody to go there, you only actually need to go to an inland border facility if you're travelling through the Port of Dover or Eurotunnel uh, and indeed Holyhead and you're moving any of the goods that fall within those categories. Um, when the customs controls uh, that we have currently end at the end of December, this year we are expecting some increases and change, changes to some of the uh, vehicle numbers at the IBFs which are already open and um, so for imports um, CTC movements under officer destination and we can expect them to increase as transit has started to use for import controls for importing goods and um, we can also expect to see that Route 1 documentary and Route 2 physical checks will be undertaken by customs officials at the IBFs, um, particularly on goods being transported okay. under CTC, uh, and that Border Force risk basing based checking of, sea, uh, of vehicles will also increase as we undertake movements to import goods. Um, there will be some additional processes in place as well to deal with goods under temporary storage. Um, the, the IBS that you can see on the screen at the moment, um, there's a number of them around the country. Uh, Warrington's close to Junction 20 of the M6, so it's got good access to uh, the kind of north of the region. Um, and Birmingham as well, close to Junction 6 and the M42. We can also expect Holyhead to be operational in January as well. Um, and North Weald is a location that's in Essex. Um, you also heard Phil, I think, mention a while ago that um, you won't necessarily be directed to the IBFs and um, there is an IBF app available for drivers um, especially if they have smartphones as well um, which will help them to get processed on the site as quickly as possible. Um, the other advantage to using the app is that you can tell HMRC in advance that that is where you intend to go and it does help um, to kind of manage the traffic as well. So the, uh, the app if you want to uh, find it is available on the Google Play Store and also on uh, the, the iPhone App Store too and if you want particular details on it then do go to gov.uk. And the next slide should show you the IBS that are in Kent. So you've already heard about Sevington being mentioned earlier on and um, you'll still see that we've got uh, Dover Western Docks and Stock 24 listed on there too. But they're still commercial operations but they can carry out the same functions that we've already spoken about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Currently most of the traffic 
uh, is using uh, Sevington and Ebsfleet in terms of outbound checks. Um, but it's, it's really important to remember that you have options. There are other sites available. Um, it gives us a bit of resilience. If anything does happen at a particular IBF, then there are other ones that you can use uh, and so shouldn't disrupt your journey too much. Uh, but I would encourage you to, to look at gov.uk uh, and to consider getting the app as well so that you're able to tell us that you're actually intending to arrive there. Um, you'll notice there's a yellow triangle on the map there that says Dover IBF. Um, that's something that's coming online a little later in the year, but it will provide yet more resilience and more options uh, for people using the short straights. Um, I think the best thing to, to kind of piece of advice to take away is to please make sure that you do have all the information that you need readily available for when you arrive at any of the IBF sites. Uh, there are plenty of people to help you at the locations, uh, HMRC and Border Force, Border Force colleagues uh, and other operators will be visible to you to help with them um, with all of any of their questions. Um, but one thing not to expect is customs agents to be on site at any of the government IBFs. Uh, if we just move on to the next slide, please. OK, so from January, um, the short states traffic requiring checks will be directed to the IBFs. Um, the full inbound checks coming into effect in July will also see traffic directed to Sevington if it requires SPS checks, which is something which was mentioned earlier on. And as the Dover site comes online, uh, comes online that's something that becomes an option for you as well. Um, so do use the Attend an Inland Border Facility online service or the app, which I've already mentioned, to help avoid delays. Um, and that will help just to make sure that there's a smooth service for the hauliers too. So pre-lodge when you can and, and let us know, let the staff know that you're on the way there. There is a full list of IBFs available on gov.uk, so it is worth uh, logging on there and just checking for any other information. Um, one thing probably worth saying is the stay at the inland border facilities are just restricted to about two hours so that we don't have um, kind of problems with with uh, people trying to stay there for too long uh, and it's not somewhere for resting, it is there for, for coming to, to carry out the customs checks. Um, at the next, uh, the next couple of slides are just pictures of uh, uh, Sevington so that you can see that the progress that's happened there over the past couple of months, uh, the weather weather has come and gone, we've seen it in all conditions, um, but uh, as you can see it is a large site, there is plenty of capacity there, there's about, there's over a thousand spaces, um, about 550 for the IBF holding spaces and we do have some contingency spaces as well for, for managing freight uh, should we need to help with any situations on the road. Um, so hopefully this has been a useful session. It's just a really quick run through of the IBFs that are in the UK for you. Um, but do visit the Hauliers Handbook or gov.uk for up to date information on the inland border facilities. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Fee. I think we have our colleague Lydia Austin from the DFT. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, please, Luke. Just, just can we just go back, Fee, to the slide about the transit um, offices because um, we've just been discussing it internally here. I think it's important that we just clarify. Um, Fee, I think there's one of the slides hasn't been updated. If you could just go back, please, Gillian, to the one that talks about which ones are offices of departure or destination. This one, Dave, would you? Uh, one before. One before, please. One Sorry, one after. The next one, please. This one. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's just important to highlight that Stop 24 and Dover Western Docks can both still be used as Office of Departure for CTC. <clears throat> so they shouldn't be blank boxes. It's really quite important. OK, thank you, Dave. Thanks, Fiona. Sorry, Fee. Thanks, Luke. Thank you for that clarification. No, good, good to note. Um, Lydia, over to you, please. Hi, thanks, Luke, uh, and hello, everyone. So I'm Lydia, and I head up the uh, Border Readiness and Kent Traffic Management team at the Department for Transport. And I'm going to talk to you briefly about our network of information and advice sites that are currently located in the United Kingdom, but recently have opened at ports 
uh, and on ferries uh, entering the short straits um, alongside um, some sites and ferry routes in Holland, the Netherlands. Apologies. So, uh, Luke, if you could flick to the next slide, please. So many of you will already be uh, in some way familiar with the Department of Transport's information and advice sites. Since they opened 12 months ago, we've had almost a million hauliers visit the sites for advice and support uh, on a number of different topics uh, spanning from how to download a Kent access permit um, in order to access Kent at the beginning of this year, right through to how to, you know, how to download GBMS, how to register and how to use it for January 2022. Um, the current network, as you can see, uh, is spread all across the UK. We have sites um, in Scotland at Lockerbie and in Holyhead, along with a number of sites across England. The majority of these are co-located with COVID test sites for hauliers requiring a COVID test. Um, we have recently launched uh, ferry crossings uh, on a number of different routes. We operate on 56 different crossings a week between um, England and France at the moment, along with uh, presence on Stena Line, and we're hoping to extend that presence to P&O ships. Uh, and this is an opportunity at any of our sites, really. It's an opportunity for hauliers who are preparing, haulier drivers, who are preparing for changes from the 1st of January to uh, access advice and support uh, and come and ask any questions really that they have about any of the changes that are coming in. We will also provide training on GBMS and on any other platforms that are required from the beginning of the year and answer any questions that drivers may have about how to access different elements of systems and also ports from the beginning of January. We should also say that we're currently providing advice on a whole range of other issues at the information and advice sites. So drivers who are interested in applying for visas, for example, um, for a short term activity in England, uh, we're providing advice on that. We're providing advice for drivers on how to apply for a passport if they currently have an ID card. Uh, so there's a full range of information available at the information and advice sites. And I promise you that if there is a question that you or one of your drivers have, it won't be the first time that we've been asked it. Um, some of our more niche uh, areas of expertise include what sort of uh, prescription glasses can be used when driving in Germany and so on. So we, we do have a wealth of experience and expertise now at the sites. All of our sites provide multilingual support. Uh, so regardless of what language your driver speaks, we should be able to provide some support to them. This year we've introduced Ukrainian uh, and Russian uh, along with Turkish into the, the mix of languages spoken at site. We also have a linguistic app. Uh, and should your drivers be completing a COVID test uh, and be found to be positive, we can also help with accommodation. Uh, Luke, next slide please. So here is some images of the, the type of support that's available at the information and advice sites at service stations across the UK. And we've recently opened a site at the Hook of Holland port and are hoping to open sites in France and in the La Junquera region of Spain before Christmas. Uh, our staff are on site. Some sites are open 24 seven. Others are open from six in the morning until until 10 at night. Uh, drivers will be able to speak to a, a human being um, who has access to all of the information within the Hawley handbook plus a wealth of other detail. Um, we have, as you can see, heated cabins so drivers can go and spend some time actually getting into the detail. Um, if there is a, a language or a technical barrier that's preventing drivers from accessing platforms like GBMS, our staff can help with that. Um, and as you can see, there are facilities there for drivers to actually um, have their documents not checked, uh, but for a light touch advisory uh, support service to, um, to help identify if there's anything that could be missing or where the driver might want to speak to their, their manager back at base. We have printers at sites as well, um, so that if a driver needs something there, then they can get it sent to the site and printed there and then. Luke, next slide please. And as I mentioned, we now have sites on a number of ferry routes, a growing number of ferry routes. These went live uh, beginning of October um, and have been very popular with drivers to date. We can't provide um, 
the full range of services, I suppose, that we do at the physical sites at motorway service stations because of some of the Wi-Fi challenges. Uh, so some of the document printing, for example, isn't quite as uh, as accessible, but we uh, have our fully trained staff, multilingual staff on the ferries, able to answer questions, provide support and signpost drivers to other locations or other sites where they might be able to get what they need. Uh, again, multilingual staff uh, on hand to answer any questions. And Heather, I believe, is planning to do some mystery shopping for us at one of our sites next week uh, to ensure that the, the service that we're offering is contemporary and uh, reflects all of the questions and, and so on that have come out of today's session. Uh, so if your drivers are using the sites, we're always happy to have feedback and we will take that into account and make sure that our staff get uh, additional training. Or if there are issues that you think the staff uh, could be better briefed on or you, you think that it would be useful for um, for drivers to know about beyond the service that's already provided. Again, happy to hear feedback and adapt the service to to contain that information. So that's a, a very whistle stop summary of the the information and advice service, but it is there for drivers. We, we will keep it in place until the end of certainly the end of March next year. Luke. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Lydia, for that update um, on the information advice sites. I'm sure that some um, of our friends on the call today have visited them or some of their drivers have. Um, thank you. Uh, we just have a final presentation, um, a very short look ahead to um, 2021 and safety and security declarations. Lorna, are you able to join us? If we could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Lorna, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks, Luke. Um, so, yeah, just to, to give a brief um, forward look to what's going to be coming from the 1st of July 2022. Um, specifically, um, we will have entry summary declarations for safety and security that will be required from the 1st of July. Um, Export health certificates will be required for all products of animal origin and certain animal byproducts. Um, you'll need to provide phytosanitary certificates for um, any regulated plants and plant products and pre notification of all products of animal origin, high risk food and feed not of animal origin, and certain animal byproducts. Um, Goods will be required to enter via a BCP in order to undergo any documentary identity and physical checks as required um, and physical checks of live animals and high priority plants and plant products will continue at places of destination until further notified. Um, so just to cover some of the really key important requirements for the safety and security information. So all imports into Great Britain um, must have a safety and security um, declaration. The information must be provided to the UK Customs Authorities. Um, we do have that under waiver at the moment. So from the 1st of July, it will be the EU to GB. Uh, movements that require, they are the last that will require that declaration. So just to be very clear, the party that's responsible for providing that safety and security information is the operator of the active means of transport. So just to break that down, when we're talking about accompanied movements, that is the haulier or the haulage company or the driver that's in charge of moving those goods. Um, for imports into Great Britain, the safety and security declaration can't be combined with the customs import declaration, so you do need to complete a separate entry summary declaration. Um, you can, as the responsible party, ask someone else within your supply chain or a customs intermediary or a third party representative to do that declaration on your behalf. Um, as the responsible party, you do retain that overall responsibility for making sure that the declaration is submitted within the legal timeframes. Um, and 
you must only get a third party to submit the declaration on your behalf with your full knowledge and consent. So you can use your existing commercial terms and conditions or you can create those new contractual agreements that really makes sure that the third party is listed as filing the entry summary declaration on your behalf. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So for imports into Great Britain, specifically for safety and security, the declaration is submitted into the, the new S&S GB service. Um, although that is a relatively new service, it has been live and active since the 1st of January 2021 for rest of world movements. So that service is up and running. Whoever submits the entry summary declaration must have a valid GB EORI number. So if you're submitting your own declarations as a whole year or driver, you'll need to have a GB EORI number. But if you're getting a third party to do it on your behalf, then it's that third party that would need to have the GB EORI number. It's whoever's actually filing the declaration. Um, as well as the GB EORI number, you would need a government gateway user ID and password if you don't already have one. You would need access to that SNS GB service and that involves registering on gov.uk. And you would need some compatible software available from third party software developers. Um, we also have community systems providers who do operate a, a large number of um, ports around the UK. You can access the SNS GB service via them or you can arrange for another third party, as I say, with access to SNS GB to submit that declaration on your behalf. Next slide, please. And I think we're back to either Heather or Luke. Heather, I think it's back to you. OK, thank you. Um, I don't think we've got any more slides to present, have we, Luke? No, nope, we've got plenty of questions, though. Got, yes, we have got a lot of questions, so I would like to, given we have so, quite a lot of time left, I would like to try and uh, go through quite a few of these. Thank you for putting our email addresses, Luke, to people uh, in the chat. So for, for those people who we will commit to answering your questions um, as soon as possible with, with our colleagues in HMRC. And I can see there's also a lot of questions about the 1st of July changes, but of course, you know, we're trying to do this in stages, so we're concentrating on the, the Christmas January 1st, and then we will be running a separate event as soon as possible on the 1st of July changes. But can, Luke, can you select from the chat the ones that you think? Um, I saw some that I thought were fairly straightforward to answer. If you could, if you could pick through the ones that have happened since we started these sessions, and then we can um, hopefully either we can answer them or Border Force or HMRC, depending on whose competence the question falls into. Thank you. We've had a few about the two hours um, at the IBF, concerns over the turnaround time from the National Clearance Hub and general questions about what happens if they exceed the two hours. So could you talk a little bit about IBF protocol? I don't know who is best to talk to that. Yeah, thanks, Luke. I'll pick that one up. It's Phil. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. I think the the the, the two hour um, window that um, that Fiona mentioned is is really what we would like to think, given the arrival at the IBF to undertake a movement or a check, that that's the processing time that we will we will definitely achieve um, to to allow the driver to carry on. What we're not saying is we're not being prescriptive to say that if a driver exceeds that two hours that we will be asking them to leave. It very much depends on a case by case basis, depending upon the status of that movement. We will obviously make inquiries on behalf of the driver the whole year um, within HMRC to try and make sure, as with destination movements, that those goods are arrived. It would be a scenario where if the paperwork hadn't been submitted, for instance, around NCH, if the declarant had not submitted that paperwork to NCH, it may be a scenario where we would ask them to do that because staying at the IBF for, for an infinite amount of time wouldn't be reasonable. 
and we wouldn't be expecting that paperwork to be completed given on on you know by the time that that driver uh, can leave that day so i think two hours is aspirational if you like it, it certainly does not set a precedent in terms of the activity that hmrc or border force colleagues or traffic marshals on site will take to move drivers along and ask them to come back. We will do everything with our power to process that particular movement and undertake that check within that time frame. But there will also always be exceptions. I hope that thank answers that. Thank you very much, Phil. Great, no, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, question here about um, when we will get a final list of ports which you know to, will be registered for GVMS um, and which will require temporary storage. Do we have any update on when private sector will know which ports they can use for which types of movement? I can take this Luke. So um, obviously some element of this is, is a commercial decision and it's for ports to decide what their uh, commercial model will be, whether they're using the, the temporary storage model or the pre lodgement model. Um, most ports have now made those decisions and we're looking to publish guidance as soon as possible. Uh, this will be, um, I think, no, no later than very early December, but we're looking to, uh, to publish uh, that sort of gui guidance on which ports will be using pre-lodgement and, uh, uh, and the GVMS uh, sort of uh, um, as, as soon as possible. So, um, so, so yes, it will be no, no later than, uh, than sort of the, the very beginning of, uh, of December, but, uh, but hopefully before that. Great, thank you. Um, there's just a few questions. I think uh, people may be getting a little bit confused about what is changing. So um, people are talking about doing their export declarations in France, that's fine. And there's been some references to only TAD MRNs being allowed in GVMS. So could we just clarify um, the fact that this is gonna change on the 1st of January? Because I think there's some confusion over this. Yeah, Luke, it, it, it is going to change on, on the 1st of January. I mean, currently in terms of GVMS and E, from, certainly for movements between EU and GB at the moment, the only option that you have is to enter that uh, that TED, TAD movement reference number from EU to GB. Um, of course, that expands out to the other movement types on the 1st of uh, on the 1st of January, but also from GB to EU, you will have that facility to be able to enter a, a TAD MRN in the circumstances where you need to enter a TAD MRN for an export. Great, thank you. Um, I know we touched on liability earlier. There's been another question about liability um, more specifically. Um, so if the GMR is created by an agent rather than the haulier, do they become liable because they are the uh, person who created the GMR? Is that one any of my other HMRC colleagues can can answer or do we need to take that one away? I think we can we can take it away to to confirm. Uh, my understanding is that the mm -hmm. the liability will will sit with uh, the person who has created the GMR. But I think also also important to to note that um, for the, the the use of GVMS, uh, that the way it has been envisioned and and the way we've uh, we've we've thought about it has been uh, that it will be the the haulier creating those those GMRs as. Uh, as, as the haulage company is sort of best best placed uh, to, uh, to to manage the GVMS process and to and to communicate with with driver drivers etc. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question on um, the ENS. Can that be merged with the import declaration post the first of July? I don't know if Lorna, you're able to speak to that. Yeah, I can do, Luke. Um, so no, the um, the entry summary declaration is a standalone safety and security declaration. And at this precise moment in time, there are no plans to amend the customs import declaration to combine those into two documents. So it is a separate declaration separate to the customs import deck.
Great, thank you. Um, somebody just asked for confirmation that hauliers will not be able to board vessels from the EU on short straight routes without a valid GVMS entry. Um, and they're also asking if Eurotunnel is including short straights. I, I can clarify that yes, it is. Um, so will hauliers be able to um, board without a GMR? So if the uh, location that they're uh, that they're going into is using the pre-lodgement model, um, then there will be a uh, legal obligation that they need to um, to carry the the GMR with all of the declaration references uh, that cover the goods that they're moving. Um, so that if if they're using uh, one of those pre-lodgement locations, then they won't be able to board without a without a valid GMR. Um, there are also some uh, locations which will be using GVMS to facilitate the movements of uh, accompanied uh, row row goods into inventory link locations. Uh, and I, I won't dwell on this too much because I, I know Heather you've you've mentioned that uh, we'll be running another inventory linked um, locations um, webinar um, but for, for for those for those movements which are using GVMS uh, the, the carriers uh, may uh, notify wh whether there's a, a um, whether they commercially require that there, there are pre-lodged uh, declarations and, and, and GMRs um, but but yes for, for, for these purposes where we're talking about um, mostly these short straights movements if they're going into to pre-lodgement locations then they need to, to have a GMR um before they uh, before they board on the eu side thank you um appreciate today is obviously focused on the short straights but we have sort of some questions on other routes so can we provide a brief overview of what um is required on routes that do not use gvms So on uh, routes that aren't using GVMS, uh, it's the 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 other model uh, that is in place uh, is the traditional temporary storage model, uh, and this is the model uh, that is currently used for uh, rest of world uh, freight that uh, that job that enters uh, the UK. Uh, under that model, um, while uh, declarations can be pre-lodged, there isn't a legal requirement for them to be pre-lodged. Uh, and goods can be stored uh, at the frontier uh, after they're presented for up to uh, 90 days before uh, a declaration, uh, a, a full customs declaration needs to be made and before duty can, can be paid. Uh, so that's the, uh, the model that's, that's currently in place for um, ports which, uh, which have sort of more space, more, uh, more um, processes to to store those goods on arrival. Uh, so for for those goods, pre, uh, declarations can either be pre-lodged uh, or the declarations can be made uh, up to ninety days after the goods uh, have arrived uh, in uh, in GB. Great, thank you. There's still lots more questions coming in. I think uh, Heather, are we handing over to you to compare um, a few more questions, if that's okay. Thanks, Luke. Um, I think Dave and I have picked up a few that we'd like to cover now because it's in um, it's some, I think some things that we could clarify that might help where there's been repeat questions. Dave, do you want to start, please? Uh, yes, thanks, Heather. So I think it's probably worth starting with um, there have been a few questions on examinations and where they may or may not take place. So I'll just clarify some of that. So um, in the slide that deals with uh, export from France and import to the UK, um, so there are two scenarios and we need to be really clear. So there may be a, an export examination by the French authorities leaving France, <clears throat> but that will be an export examination um, in the French SI Brexit system. There is no proposal for Border Force to do an import examination in a French port. All import um, examination requirements will be dealt with in the UK um, and um, an IBF in the UK. It's a really, really important point of clarity. The only border force inspection in France 
will be in the current scenario. So as is, if we decide to uh, select a vehicle for a security check or and every vehicle, obviously every driver has to go through an immigration check. So examinations in France will only be by the French for customs <coughs> um, procedures. First point of clarity, uh, not for GVMS examinations. Um, the second, which has come up several times, is the um, will every truck be inspected while entering the UK? The answer to that is at an IBF in Kent. The answer to that is no. So only vehicles that are required to go to an IBF because they've received a message to say that they are to attend for an examination. Now that may be a paperwork examination or a physical examination of the goods and that message will be communicated uh, to the driver or a representative, whoever is uh, designated. Um, the other scenario is if you need to go to an IBF to, uh, for your entry uh, procedure. So for instance, if you're on a transit movement and you need to end your transit movement, you may also need to go to an IBF. But for clarity, not every vehicle entering the UK will be required to go for an examination. It's subject to the particular scenarios that I've just talked about. Um, so they're the really, really important points um, I wanted to mention on that. Um, Heather, back to you for another point. Uh, a couple that I saw, I don't know if Lydia is still on the call and whether this is for the Department for Transport or HMRC or both, but there was a question that I spotted that if you, uh, the driver attends the IBF and they're running short of driver hours, um, what do they do? How, where, where should they be held? Because they're not supposed to move the vehicle once they've exceeded the driver hours. Lydia, is that for you? I think you're on mute. Uh, it will be between Fiona and I. Uh, I don't have the uh, answer at my fingertips, but let me come back to you. I'll commit to get an answer at the end of the meeting. Thank you. And um, one that I, I actually don't know the answer to something that Dave, you do, that if uh, if Chief issues an inspection route one uh, when the vehicle's crossing the channel and knows that they therefore have to go to attend an IBF, do they send the entry and supporting documents to the National Clearance Hub or to the IBF or to both? Is that an HMRC question? I think that's an HMRC question. Paul or Phil, could you help me with that one, please? Yeah, Heather, it's Phil. So the document, the, the paperwork will need to go to NCH directly in order to um, facilitate um, that particular movement, so it won't go to an IBF. However, if that paperwork then is not submitted, the driver potentially will turn up at the IBF and we will need to progress chase that with NCH um, in order for that driver to be processed and um, for that check to be undertaken and for obviously that to be um, cleared on chief. Does that, does that answer that question? So is it both or? No, it's the paperwork goes to NCH, it doesn't go to the IBF. OK, thank you, it's Phil. I think it's, I can see in the chat as well, there's obviously several people asking for answers to their questions um, in writing, which we'll commit to do hopefully by the end of this week. Um, I would like, Phil, while I've got you on the hook as well, I don't know if this is you or this is Paul, probably more in the um, in the Paul space. But the one about what happens um, if you're entering GB or even leaving GB with an empty container. So this could obviously be an empty container with or without reusable packaging. Is the GMR still necessary where there are no actual goods on board the vehicle? It will be if you're moving through a GMR port, Heather. Yeah, uh, I think the, the, the main difference is, you know, if you're, uh, it's the direction that you're, that you're traveling in. If you're going from uh, GB to, to EU, if you're moving under a transport contract, you'll need an, an exit summary declaration as well. I'll let Lorna come in and correct me if I've got anything wrong there, because it's, most, it's mostly a safety security aspect. But uh, yes, you'll need a GMR in, in, in both directions. Uh, the, the main difference is that safety and security aspect. Yeah, that was spot on, Paul. So yeah. any ve empty vehicles, containers, 
or pallets, including that reusable packaging, will need to have an exit summary declaration that's been in place since the 1st of October. Um, and then when the GMR requirement comes in, then that will need to go into the GMR. Just for completeness, Lorna, thank you for that. Does that include um, empty tractor units with no trailer on the back of them? Um, only if that empty tractor unit was being moved under a transport contract. If it was the whole year's own and they're simply taking it back up to the country that they came from, then they don't need the EXS. It's only where they're moving it on behalf of somebody else under a transport contract. Okay, thank you, Laura. Thank you. Luke, do we have any others that I've I've um not spotted because there's there's quite a few in the chat that I can see while we've still got people um giving us their time on the call that we could answer or direct to um HMRC colleagues or DFT colleagues or border force. Heather, while Luke is looking uh, at the questions, I can give you an update on the driver's hours question. Um, from my, my colleagues um, back at DFT Towers, uh, they've confirmed that if a driver is low but not out of driver's hours, then we'll advise them to go to the nearest truck stop. So in the case of Sevington, that would be stop 24 or one of the other truck stops in the Kent area. But if a driver has completely run out of driver's hours, then they can, of course, stay until they're in a position to move on safely. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, We've had a lot of questions about um, other ports again, which I think we've kind of covered. Um, sorry, I'm just having a look now. Um, however, I don't know if you've got any others you want to pick up on. Well, th there are a lot, Luke. So I think the, the, the best thing to do and the, and the most um, the correct thing to do is to we've got them all documented, haven't we, Luke, in a separate document. The team have been capturing them. So let's I know Stephen's very keen that we do this as well. I don't know if Stephen, you can hear me, but um, we, we want to make a commitment to answer them by the end of the week. Stephen, are you on the phone? No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Apologies for technical challenges earlier, so seeing web dialogue board readiness. I mean, just absolutely, Heather. I mean, I think there may be one or two questions we won't be able to answer, but I'd rather just sort of go through. We've, we've had amazing attendance today. We've probably had 1,500 people. As I make it, we've got about 150 questions that we haven't been able to, to cover. So really important that we come back and give you chapter and verse on as much of that as possible and I think um, we will be there's, there's a good question there about how you give feedback in on this event and what people found useful and I think might ask you to say a couple of words about that Heather but I think it's very clear to us that the inventory link port the, the other ports it's important to have a parallel event like this on them it may well be useful having another session on this and hopefully we've We'll have given you um, more answers on the on the questions that have been raised, but um, I mean, it's been a, it's been a fantastically useful session for us. I hope it has been for you all as well. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Luke, are we um, are we on for sort of wrapping this up with final closing remarks now? Or is there anything else you would like to that you've, you or the team have, have identified that we might want to bring out in the remaining few minutes? Just one more. We've got a few questions on that I think might be worth doing. Empty packaging uh, that do not that does not require an import or export declaration that can be declared by conduct. Does that need to go on GVMS? And if so, what reference should the uh, should you use because obviously there's no import or uh, declaration associated with it. Hi Luke, it, it does need to, to go on. Um, you select the empty option within the decks by declarations by conduct section of the GMR and we will demonstrate how you do that as part of our webinar in uh, in late November. So we'll do some of that show and tell as part of the as part of our session. Great, thank you. I think that was all there from me. If we could go to the next slide and Heather, Dave and Stephen, um, if you could wrap up, please. Uh, 
Thanks. If Dave and I can go first, please, Stephen, and then you make the closing remarks. I think there's three sort of big areas that we haven't overemphasized today that need to be overemphasized again. I think HMRC colleagues would um, would would want me to say this, but to prepare for 1st of January, register for GVMS if you haven't done already, because you will need to. Um, this, the second point is I've noticed in the chat there's been several asks, and if HMRC could consider this, I know you're doing webinars, uh, show and tells, and there's some industry days planned with BPDG, and there's obviously further events like this. But we would, we would, it would be wrong of me to not mention that several people in the chat have asked for a training manual for GVMS so that they have a document that they can refer to. So if I can pass that to HMRC to consider, please. And then the final one is one I think Dave wants to um, just to emphasise again on the 24-7 uh, cover. Yes, yeah, so there have been a few comments in the <clears throat> in the um, comments bar about 24-7 access uh, to information. Um, and, and whilst that is a change, I know and we understand that is a change to industry in the way that industry uh, operates currently or has done in the past. But over the last year at the IVFs, um, we have seen a significant factor in delays uh, and problems encountered is because the driver that presents the goods and any necessary paperwork isn't necessarily informed enough to make changes or add additional information when that is required for the examination, which results in very significant delays until the office that supports that driver can actually provide him with the information or revise paperwork. Um, so we understand that that is uh, possibly a change for um, some elements of the industry, but actually it is, it's going to be required um, from the 1st of January that they have better access to information if they're not fully prepared for the IBF examination. And then I've just got one more, Dave, if that's all right. That just to remember to the back, the beginning of the customer journey, for every import to GB, there's an export from the EU. So we need to remember that there are two processes and to make sure all that the relevant export accompanying documents or the use of the logistics envelope is done at the same time as preparing for the import to GB. Martin, anything from you? No, I don't think so. Anything else? No. Stephen, if you can still hear us, it would be great if you could just um, uh, make the final closing remarks, please. On a drum roll. <laughs> Good, thank you very much. Well, I mean, as I said, this has been a really useful um, session for us and um, do hope it has been for you. I think we will be able to share this material, which um, hopefully you will find helpfully and help internally briefing your, your colleagues and your team. I think we've also we've been very pleased about the positive feedback we've had from things like the Hawley's handbook and we've recently filled that something even more narrowly into the into our flyer that we're going to be distributing um, for Hawley's and including through the information post that DFT colleagues were, were talking about earlier. So as I say we will come back on these questions as much as possible. I like Heather, I've been very struck with the sort of appetite for user manuals in some areas and for testing. It is worth saying that um, as well as the technical testing that colleagues in HMRC have been doing, we do have a series of sort of end-to-end -end tests that we're running in, in my area in BPDG. And we had the first one just last week, which was looking at automotive parts, you know, coming in through Eurotunnel. And we're having a series of others of those which will hopefully give us a, a quite realistic feel. I mean, working with actual suppliers coming in to so hopefully give us a, an actual feeling for how things are going to go down after the 1st of January. We will also need to think a little bit about how we communicate the results, how those went and the results of those, because that might be useful for um, partners on this call as well. So thank you all. Thank you for the great attendance. Thank you all for the very, you know, appropriately challenging and very helpful, insightful questions. And um, probably look forward to seeing you some of, some of you again on a, on a later event as well as we in the run up to 1st of January. So thank you all very much.